This is the Norseman Extreme Triathlon. It's known as one of the toughest events on the planet and it's my first ever full distance Ironman. And it's here in Norway, the land of the midnight sun, the Vikings, and some of the most breathtaking scenery. Its high peaks and vast fjords etched out by the ice age have created one of the most gruelling terrains I've ever seen. I know that's happened, but they're not here. Uh, yeah, this race really scares me. It's, uh, yeah, this is, been known as one of the toughest events in the world. Yeah, I'd be mad if I wasn't scared of this event. The Norseman Triathlon first took place back in 2003 with just 21 participants. Today, there are thousands of applicants with just 300 athletes being lucky enough to get a start. It's known as one of the hardest events in the world, and here's why. It starts by jumping off the back of a ferry into the freezing cold water of the Hardanger Fjord for a 3.8 kilometer swim. Then a 180 kilometer bike. This starts with a grueling 40 kilometer climb from sea level up to over 1200 meters. This brings us to the largest mountain plateau in Northern Europe, the Hardanger Vida. Onto the second half of the bike, there isn't a flat square inch with the final nail in the coffin, a seven kilometer brutal climb with a total elevation of 3,500 meters. Now, despite the brutal bike course, it is in fact the run that Norseman is legendary for. It's a 42.2 kilometer run. It starts by following the valley floor towards Mount Gustatoppen. It's at this point we begin to climb. And boy, do we climb. The next 10K is up the infamous Zombie Hill. And it's here, the cutoff point, where the first 160 athletes are allowed up to the top of the mountain for the Black Finishers t-shirt. The run tackles hills, mountains, rocks and boulders, a total of over 1,700 meters of climbing, all of which happens within the final 17 kilometers of the race. Now, to put this into perspective, every athlete is required to have a support crew that follow them throughout the day, including even having to run up the mountain section. This has been really tough for me to train for. It's been really hard for me and my girlfriend. Um, we, you know, I've had to sacrifice so much in terms of getting my training in. Uh, so actually for me, if I can get to the top of that mountain, fingers crossed, I get that black t-shirt and I go to the top, um, that, that would mean so much, not only for me, but also for my girlfriend and also for the support team here. Global Triathlon Network phrase that everyone that's helped me make this possible. In a weird way, I was relieved to finally be here. I've raced professionally hundreds of times, but for some reason, this time felt different. I've visited Norway before and I've always been taken in by the scenery, but these mountains surrounding me all of a sudden felt a lot bigger knowing I'd have to climb them in less than 24 hours time. This race has been on my mind for so many years and for the first time, I wasn't racing for money or for a job. I was racing for me and for those who helped to get me here. Do you want to catch us both diving? Yeah. Should yeah. we go off this side? It is deep enough to dive, right? Yeah. <laughs> this, as many of you know, is Fraser. A colleague, a friend, and a very accomplished Ironman, and most importantly, an experienced Keltman finisher. And this is Cassie, my partner of four years, my biggest supporter, and despite ignoring her for my training the past few months, surprisingly, she really wanted to be here, and I felt so much more confident knowing she would be there on race day. She was so perfect. Make a nice sandwich. Yeah. Yeah, that would be fun. So this makes up my support crew. They will both be following me throughout the course of the race, effectively a mobile aid station and helping me to get around this event in one piece. It's 3 a.m. This was it. The culmination of all that sacrifice and all that training. Sorry. 
I'm pretty nervous now, it's all becoming a little bit real. Tension's just sort of building for the next hour as we get the ferry, go out into the middle of the fjord, we wait, we jump off, we've got 10 minutes then until the start. Um, so yeah, I like, part of me is just wants to get on with this. Um, obviously, big day ahead, so very nervous. As I stood there looking around at all the other nervous faces, it started to get to me. Okay, moments away from the door opening and jumping into the water. This is the big unknown for me. <laughs> First time distance, <laughs> toughest race out there. But this was no time to back out. It was cold. Without thinking, I'd somehow managed to swim my way to the front. It was just a natural reaction. My mood was up and it felt good to have a lead. Although oddly, I was having some slight issues with cramp in my legs. Mark is almost out of the water. We've just spotted him on this jetty here where the ferry picked him up about an hour ago, an hour and a half ago. And it's lined with people, everyone's cheering him on. It's really exciting. So I've now got to get to the exit of the water because we have to be there ready for your, your athlete to run through transition and then help them. So I'm going to get my way there now. How do you feel? Uh, all right. Yeah. How much of a gap have I got? Quite a lot. At least 200 metres, so there's quite a long gap there. And it's very spread out, so... I would just take it. Nice. means get a gap, I just like... Well, I think that's just instinctive, isn't it? With a gap of roughly three minutes, I knew I would have to pace myself. My competitive nature really wanted to do nothing but race, but I couldn't let it get the better of me. I let the excitement settle, locked in and started to appreciate the scenery. I actually started to have fun. I was enjoying the scenery. I settled into a good rhythm and it was great to see Fraser and Cassie out on the road. I don't think I'd have any doubts about him completing the race. I think he'll definitely, he'll definitely complete it. He's, um, he's got the skills in the back, he's got the, the background in, in these activities. Coming out of the fog after the climb, I was tired. I'd allowed myself to be passed by a few people, not trying to follow them took a lot out of me mentally. But more than that, my legs were really cramping and for the first time, I was genuinely worried. My support team was seven kilometers downhill from me and from experience, I knew that all I needed was some electrolytes. When, when, I, got, when I fell over and he was like, electrolytes, and I, not, and I, I remember then, they're not in there. This red bag, there's this red bag here underneath the seatbelt. I don't know how they've gone missing, but. Cassie, I know you think, but nothing went in the bag. 
Mancini. Unless there's somehow an underneath the seat or I can well, the thing is, in a long race like this, when you tend to need something like an electrolyte drink, you need it right now. And Mark's had to wait a good 20 minutes for us to find the electrolyte tabs. Then we've had to catch back up to him with the car. So I do feel a bit guilty about that because we don't really know what impact that's going to have on him physically. With 130 kilometers covered, I was into the last 50 kilometers of the bike, but with the nail in the coffin, the final climb of the bike course still awaiting my arrival. This was my last opportunity to use my support crew as for the final 30 kilometers from the top of this climb, I would be alone as no support cars are allowed to help beyond here. I was hot, I was still cramping, but the bike leg was almost over. One more climb and I can tuck in on my aero bars and get down to T2 and be reunited with my support crew. <laughs> Never thought that was gonna end. Sit down, sit down on the um, wooden bench. Turn around and sit down, aren't you? Oh, how are you? Yeah, right. <laughs> really, really well. Cramping quite a lot though, like all the way. Like I just... You got enough salt? Yeah. Are you, have you got any more pills here? Like, the... I haven't got pills, no, but we'll I, I'll be following you in a second, right? so I'll get some more. It began to occur to me that I was already in the unknown. I'm relatively inexperienced at running a marathon, let alone running a marathon off of a long bike leg. I had 25 kilometers of flat running to prepare me for what was going to be one of the biggest mental and physical battles I'd ever undertake. my legs started to feel a lot better than I expected. They felt less heavy than they have all day and I found a really nice rhythm. Now, although my physical state was improving, it was becoming apparent that it may be my mental state that could get the better of me. Just don't like seeing him struggling. I'm not worried, I know he can do it. It's just how we can break it down for him to get in there. I was barely halfway through the run and I'd stopped enjoying myself. And unfortunately, that is when I caught my first glimpse of the mountain. And it broke me, absolutely broke me. I did start to wonder how on earth am I actually gonna be able to do this? Um, yeah, my body just, it literally, I literally felt like I was crumbling, like every step felt so hard. I had to go to a walk um, and when I, I went to that walk, the thought of getting going again was really tough and I've worked so hard to get to this point, then to suddenly start walking felt like a failure and that's a long old time to feel like a failure for all the way up there. So yeah, there was a part of me that was starting to wonder, am I going to make this? 
um, at the bottom of Zombie Hill. Fraser joined me on the run, um, which was good and bad because I was probably at my lowest point and actually I needed that company, but at the same time, I was the worst company to have. Like, I did not want to talk. I wasn't really in the mood for chatting. Um, I just wanted to get to the top of that. But having Fraser there was really helpful. It just sort of put the pressure on. Um, it made everything a little bit more real that these guys are out here for me and I can't let them down. It was a pretty pivotal moment in the whole race. Um, the top 160 get to go onto the top of Mount Gustav top into the black finisher t-shirt. The rest of the field go along to the white finisher t-shirt. Um, and yeah, I mean, to be honest, that was one of the biggest motivators for me doing this race is to get that black t-shirt. So I got to the top of Zombie Hill, actually probably in the top 15, top 20, so actually quite high up. So that was a massive motivator to me, not only as I was get, getting to the top of Zombie Hill, but then from there on, it sort of lifted me knowing that I've made it and I'm gonna get this black t-shirt. So that really pushed me on and, um, and also knowing it's just five kilometers to go, I'm gonna do this. And yeah, I just found some new legs, so like a new lease of life and I just, I just, yeah, I was like, I was like wired. I've got to get to the top of that point and just, there's no stopping me. Well, the finish line, it's quite a bleak point on the mountain, really. It's, uh, it's basically a mast at the top and, and literally at the summit, it's like a real point on the mountain. So there's not all that much there, but the mast. And you've got to work your way up these steps. You come off of sort of this pretty off-road, bouldery, path. Finally onto some steps, but my goodness, the steps just seem to go on forever. But as you get into the top, obviously, you're, it's quite exposed, the wind's picking up, um, you're shattered. Um, so yeah, it, it, was, it was a really tough point. You're so close, yet so far. Um, and as you're getting closer, you can hear the roar from the top where all the spectators are, there's the event. Uh, so that's really pushing you on. So uh, whilst you're struggling so much, again, it's another sort of lift and energy to get you there. So yeah, I'm like kind of hands on my knees, sort of pushing myself up each step, getting myself there. The, the, the roar's getting louder and louder and you finally, finally get there. And yeah, I mean, like that was an emotional, emotional time. Just those last few steps, getting over that finish line. Oh, good one, Mark. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was one of the best things I've ever done. It is fair to say that the sport of extreme triathlon has been on quite a journey of late. Having started out as a very niche and particular offshoot of the sport of triathlon, reserved really for just the committed few, with its humble origins over a decade ago at the now famous Norseman event in Norway, to, well, now becoming a really sought after event that athletes from around the globe want to be a part of. Yeah, and now that the dust has settled on both Fraser and I attempting our first extreme triathlon back in the summer, we thought we'd have a little debrief of sorts, get stuck into the nitty gritty of these events and how it went for us, why we got involved, and give you some tips actually. Yeah. And maybe if you are interested in doing your own extreme triathlon, maybe just learn from our mistakes. This has been really tough for me to train for. It's been really hard for me and my girlfriend, um, yeah, I'd be mad if I wasn't scared of this event. To say I'm proud is really an understatement. What he's achieved throughout his whole career is it's quite an achievement. You're right, he won't take this because they worry too much about warming yeah, up again. Trying to put that on, he won't. <laughs> Right, Mark, I did Keltman, you did Norseman, 
But in all seriousness, why did we choose these races? Well, I can only speak on my behalf here, but <laughs> for the yeah. t-shirt, obviously. <laughs> Barely taking it off since. Obviously, yeah. you've got a t-shirt as well. Can smell that that's been on there for a little No, no, yeah, I mean, I did do um, my race a few months before Mark did, so I wore mine out a little bit too quickly. Yeah, it did smell a bit um, But I started the same colour with this video here. So I got my blue one and Mark's got his black one. Yeah, um, but in all seriousness, um, Norseman's just been on my radar for years. It's one of these events that's just, it's grown, as we sort of mm. said already. Um, I love Norway, the scenery's incredible, but obviously the fact that it has been dubbed one of the toughest triathlons or one of the toughest events in the world. I was just drawn to that, that kind of masochist mindset in, mm. in me. Just, I want to kind of experience or push my body to the limit and see what I'm capable of. And I don't know, like that, that was pretty much it for me. I wanted to see if I could do this thing. And you love the idea that having not done a full distance Ironman, that would be a pretty corker of an event to do as your first one. Kind of cool to come back in the office and uh, when people say, oh, so have you done an Ironman? I'm like, no, but I have done Norseman. Yeah, so which yeah. <laughs> is kind of up there at the pinnacle of events. I mean, for me, Kettleman was um, a race that, I'll be honest, didn't actually appeal to me too much when I was racing full time for the main reason being that it seemed blooming tough, like more than blooming tough, extremely tough. I knew quite a few people who had done the race a number of times and everything about it just seemed awfully difficult. But once I moved away from racing, you know, professionally and regular Ironman, I suppose you'd call it, very quickly realised, you know what, there's actually only one big race in Scotland that I never managed to do and that was it. And I think you touched on something really good there actually because I think we all get caught up in times mm. and paces so much, particularly when we were racing professionally. Whereas this race, it's, it's not really about times or pace. It's about this race with yourself or this kind of like, this challenge in yourself. And a lot of it is mindset. And it's just trying to get through this epic day out and just trying to get to the end. So the times almost become irrelevant, unless you're obviously competing at the front of the race. But it is, um, it, it's kind of quite nice actually to take a step away from that pointy end of racing. I, I couldn't agree more. That being said, I would be lying. I still didn't scan through the results in previous years, see how fast were they doing it? What was a rough winning time? <laughs> Just to get a handle of how long I was going to be out there, I might add. All right, well, that sort of moves us on to the next question. I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, did we feel prepared? Did you feel prepared for anything? <sighs> No, not, not for the gravity of the race that I was having to go and do. I knew exactly how tough the race was. I know we keep saying that because that's what these are. They are very tough races. Um, you know, I had done my best to feel equipped for the swim and the bike distances, the run in particular, marathon distance, of course, because it's a full Ironman, but it was over mountainous terrain and I I'm just not used to climbing mountains. The Keltman in particular has two summit um, passes that you go over during the course of the marathon and I'm just not used to doing that sort of running or really not done an awful lot of hill climbing if I'm perfectly honest so that worried me and I just didn't feel very prepared for that. Yeah and I don't think it really matters how much racing we've done over the years or professional events or whatever nothing really prepared us for this event or our events Keltman and Norseman they are so totally different we're definitely out of our depth. Yeah I mean everything about the race neither of us had attempted to do before, we'd had no dry runs, neither of us had wrecked any of the courses beforehand, which would have been something that we would really ideally have liked to have done. You know, for, for in both cases, I mean, Norway and the north of Scotland for us where we are right now working was just too far away, unfortunately, to get to at the weekends, for example, to maybe have a look at and get familiar with the course, which an awful lot of people had done, certainly in, in Keltman. I was aware of that when I got to the race. People would be asking me, what do you think about this and what do you think about that? And, I would sheepishly have to go, mm, not so sure. <laughs> yeah, um, 100%, I couldn't agree more. In Norseman, you could tell people just knew the mm. course inside out. Definitely, uh, most people that were racing around me had done the race numerous times before and had got that experience. That said, the events are really good at trying to get that information across to you if you are someone like us turning up on the day, more or less, and just racing. like. I did more or less know where I was going and what to expect and photos of certain junctions and I could see the gradients everywhere so it wasn't like we were going into the complete unknown but having that little bit of experience might have been... Yeah, no, absolutely. I suppose we should clarify that we had done our absolute best from afar and I had spoken to everybody that I could and I was aware of what was going to be coming throughout the course of the race but there's nothing better than having actually had a look at something beforehand because you still feel like it's a little bit blind and um, for both of us that was part of the excitement I guess. Yeah, which you know, another thing that maybe we weren't fully prepared for was 
actually the support, mm. um, which is a really big factor for these extreme triathlon events or X tri series events, because you don't have aid stations out there. Mm -hmm. You are kind of fending for yourself along with your support team. So the idea is, as an athlete, you have a support team. So as soon as you come out that swim, the support team are in the car and they follow you. They essentially leapfrog you throughout the race, meaning that you can stop or grab stuff on the go and they're essentially your mobile aid station. And that takes a lot of planning. Yeah. And like you're worrying enough about the race itself, let alone mm. then trying to pass all this information on and making sure that boxes and bags are ready with the correct nutrition and clothing should you need it. Your, your, your support team needs to know all of this and know, needs to know where to stop appropriate places, climbs rather than descents, etc. It's, it's, it's all about having some systems in place and that obviously is a lot easier if you've got practice and if you've done it before and again neither of us had done this before. I was lucky that at least some of my support team had been to Calman before, had raced over the race, Sean my support runner, he had done it so that helped me a lot so I was quite lucky in that regard but we still had kind of a, a bit of a you know let's hope it all works lucky as we go type attitude in my support car. We had a vague system that we chatted about in the preceding days, but the first time that we were all actually together in one place was the day before the race, which was for, for us a little bit hectic because there's a ton of other stuff that needs to get done the day before. And then likewise, when we were in Norway, we still had to kind of firm those things up really close to you getting in the water, really. Well, yeah, I mean, I literally, the night before the race, I was just mm. popping stuff in, like, Bike, they were basically like bike helmet bags, weren't they? I was just like checking bits in and like, you know, it was quite late at night, so Fraser didn't see this before the race, and I was literally like in the morning at 3 a.m. Fraser, here we go. Yeah. This is that, this is that, this is that. Um, fingers crossed, let's, let's make this happen. And let's hope that everything stays fairly organized in the car, which if you have watched Norseman video, you might have noticed we got a little bit disorganized. You did a fantastic car. job. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's something to be mindful of if you are going to do an extreme triathlon event. Yeah, you, you simply have to have full um, trust, I guess, in the um, support car that you've got looking after you the whole way through the race because you really are reliant upon them and you look forward to seeing them as you say at those leapfrog points. It's when am I going to see them next? And you have a little bit, certainly I was having a little bit of dialogue and saying, right guys, you know, when will I see you next or how far will it be? Or if I hadn't had that, I would just be, you know, um, hopeful that it would never be too far down the road that I'd see them. And I brought that into our support car, I feel, for Norseman, because I, I, I hope that me knowing that in my race would be useful for Mark. So I always tried to say to Cassie, let's not be too far away from Mark when we stop again. Yeah, and that was, um, I mean, the support team is invaluable. It's, mm -hmm. it's literally impossible without the support team. Um, but now let's talk about the race itself. So yeah. how was Keltman for you? Yeah, I mean, let's not beat around the bush. These races are extreme, they're supposed to be extreme, and that should make you feel nervous beforehand, whether you've done the race before or not, like we hadn't. So first and foremost, the swim. I was genuinely worried about the cold water that is up there in the northwest of Scotland because I know it's cold, it, it does not get particularly warmer at any time of the year in those waters. Um, and I don't do a lot of swimming in cold water. I don't like it wouldn't choose to do it. So I hadn't been in practicing beforehand. That was a choice of mine. I just decided that no, I'd made my um, commitment to the type of equipment I would use, as thick a wetsuit as I could get a hold of, some extra neoprene that I'd wear under that. We'll come back to that later. Some booties that I'd wear on my feet and an extra skull cap for my head. So that was my precaution for hopefully getting through the swim in as well, as, as, as comfortable a manner as possible. Um, and I knew you were the same when we got to Norway, you were worried, but we actually had a little bit of a surprise. Well, yeah, in Norway, actually, had heat waves. So <laughs> yeah. um, it, I'm the same as Fraser, it never really coped well in the cold. Mm. Um, that said, we've always raced in the cold as if it was a professional race. So we were wearing basically <laughs> just our tri suit, normal wetsuit, maybe a skull cap at most. We weren't actually racing with potential like base layers underneath or thicker skull caps or booties that would help to keep us warm because it was a real fast mm -hmm. race. Um, whereas for the Norsemen obviously and the Keltman, we could go in there a little bit better prepared. This is a long day out. Let's just make sure we get through this and we survive the cold. So we were prepared for the, that potential. Yes. Um, we had these neoprene base layers we got from Orca, um, the, the, what's it called? The heat seeker um, base layer, which was fantastic. We had the skull caps, booties all prepared, but we had a heat wave in Norway. Um, so actually it was extreme in almost the other sense. It was so hot. The water was still quite cold, 
but the, during the day it was really hot, but it did mean that I didn't need the space layer. I didn't need a skull cap. I did wear a thermal wetsuit just mm -hmm. to be safer. I probably still didn't need that. Um, but yeah, that, that was obviously a big worry for me too. Yeah, these, these are just, um, you know, par for the course, what is that you have in extreme distance racing is being able to cope with these elements. And I was really glad that I got through that swim without it sort of implicating further on my race. Although the heat seeker neoprene vest that Mark talked a lot about there, I might have forgotten to take mine off when I started my bike ride, which maybe explained why I was feeling so desperately hot in the first portion of my bike ride. Um, if you maybe watched our video, you'll notice that I had to stop in a panic to get my support team to help me pull it off because pulling a neoprene vest off is a rather difficult thing to do when you're tired and hot and grumpy. Um, but it certainly did a job and kept me warm. Um, so we had a little bit of a chuckle about that. Yeah, that was quite funny. Um, On to the bike then. Um, how did you find it? Yeah, um, I loved it actually. For the most part, I, um, I, I felt like I had done a reasonable amount of long bike rides. Um, Norseman is extremely hilly. Keltman is just a little bit hilly, but actually quite long. It's over 200 kilometers long, just because there's so few roads in Scotland to make the loop work. They just had to have a 200 plus kilometer ride. So I was a little bit anxious about that because I haven't ridden that far you know, very it's longer than an Ironman, a traditional Ironman, so it was a little bit into the unknown for me. Um, but I really enjoyed the first portion of the bike. We were lucky we had a tailwind, so that sort of got me going. Well, um, we were actually kind of in a similar situation because you led the swim out. Yes. I led the swim out in, Nor in Norseman. So actually we were kind of, we are both being chased for the first portion of the race, which I haven't thought about before. So actually we yeah, had a good in, a, in, a similar, in a similar situation. I think you've got a little bit more experience over this kind of distance. So you maybe had a bit more confidence, whereas I was definitely kind of trying to keep a cap on it um, at, in the early stages. Cause I literally was, I was already in the unknown after the swim actually. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and let's, not, let's not shy away from the fact that although Keltman had a really good, you know, small field of, of men that I was, you know, really, um, um, mindful of and respectful of racing against. You were doing the X-Tribe World Championships. There was a whole slew of excellent athletes chasing down yeah. after you on the yeah. bike, so you really had to be careful. They were fast, yeah, and it was quite yeah. hard not getting carried away. I did go with them for like five to 10 minutes at one point. I was like, what am I doing here, Mark? Yeah. You just let them go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you, you hung on to that for quite a long time, that lead. Um, it was yeah. only in the latter stages uh, uh, that you got past, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, and, and, and to be honest, I really started to struggle towards the end of my bike ride. The last hour of the ride really was tough going for me, and I'm sure the same as you, all I wanted to do was just get off the bike, because quite honest, six hours of riding is just a long time and I was looking forward to the marathon although worried about it because like I talked about earlier I knew how tough that marathon was and I did feel underprepared. Yeah well I was actually weirdly where I was so cautious on the bike mm. actually feeling quite strong towards the end. I had a lot of issues with cramping early on in the race during the swim and the bike and actually that kind of held me back in, in a way. It very uncomfortable meant that I couldn't get down the aero bars and or well, comfortably into the aero bars. So actually on the last climb although it was tough very hot actually felt really good and I was I, I, I couldn't believe it I was like 150k into the race and I'm like <laughs> good to go I could actually push on but maybe I should hold back because I still got a marathon to go yeah and that was interesting because in the Norseman we as a support team we weren't allowed to see Mark for that final 30k so about 150k mark on that final climb we were able to give him his last bit of nutrition that we could give him and just make sure that he was okay and just reassure him that right cool we need to drive on now and we'll see you at T2 and wait for you there to get you on for the marathon and I think that was um, that was probably I'm gonna say difficult part for you because obviously you were coping with it but it's still that notion that actually right that's me just gonna have to settle in and just look after myself yeah. now. I have to say I mean obviously I was into the unknown a lot of new experiences in this race I had my first pee on the bike <laughs> very proud of that yeah, um, yeah. he told uh, us that yeah as well. twice actually <laughs> um, learned some tips uh, phrases said you know use a bit of water after very yeah, good tip. Go yeah. clean. Yeah. Um, also, actually, just like so tired being in the aero bars <laughs> after 180k. I was actually on the descent, so I was like, actually, just like putting my chin onto the elbow cup <laughs> um, so I could rest my neck. And I was going at like 90k an hour with my chin on the elbow cup. I wouldn't recommend that, no. but I was just like, my head is so tired. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was an awesome experience. Then getting into the transition, knowing you've got a marathon to come. It's a little bit daunting, I've got to say. Yeah, and then that again, coming back to our support team is where you, um, you look forward to seeing them because there's been a little bit of a time. The same for me. I, I hadn't seen my support team for a little while towards the end of the bike. So you look forward to that. It perks you back up again. 
re-motivates you to start tackling the next leg of the race, which is this marathon. And in both cases, we were, you know, worried about it because you had never done a marathon in a race and I hadn't ever done a mountainous marathon. So it was really good to have support team there, but also that they were calm and they weren't getting you worried or anything. And I think in both cases, well, certainly Cassie and I tried to, we were making sure, or Cassie made sure you were covered in sunscreen. Um, with my guys, they were just making sure that I was just, you know, calm and collected and, yeah, just making sure that you are focused. Or now, um, I know, having trained with you in the lead up to Keltman, running prep hadn't been ideal, right? So um, you had a little bit of a niggle with your hip, but you did remarkably well considering that you had had this hip niggle going into it. At what point during the run did things start to go a little bit south? Pretty quickly, unfortunately, Mark. Um, in advance, I knew that the marathon had um, two sections, essentially, an easier first section, or, or so I felt, leading into the second more mountainous half of the marathon. I woefully underestimated how hard that first easy section of the marathon was. It was over some really open exposed moorland, really difficult terrain actually. You were, it was runnable but slow going and, and, and basically my morale got low, I was struggling, I wasn't feeling great, low in energy, all the things you don't want to happen. And as I got through to the second portion of the marathon, you had to stop and do a mandatory kit check um, before you went up the mountain. And at that T2A, as it was called, point in the Keltman, I was really quite low and genuinely concerned about A, whether I could keep going and B, whether I should attempt to go up a mountain in this state, which I suppose most people in the race are going through at different times. This just happened to be my low point. And similarly, watching you in Norseman, round about the midpoint of the marathon, a, 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 an equally difficult low point? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I was. So for Norseman, it actually starts off pretty much yes. pancake flat. You follow mm. the road uh, around the lake on, yeah, a well paved tarmac road. So it's actually quite easy underfoot, very different from what you had underfoot. Yes. Pancake flat, and then the second half, you essentially start the mountain climb. And it's a, it's a lot mm. of elevation in a short space of time. Um, and actually, I felt fine up until about. 22k you turn this corner and you see the mountain <laughs> and I'd always pride myself on being mentally tough like you know I get through a lot and actually dig a lot deeper than I think I my body should be able to go sometimes it broke me mm. absolutely broke me like um, and I thought it was physical I thought I was falling apart but actually looking back on it now it was completely mental it was all in my head and I panicked, I got myself in this tears, I was sort of like, I was welling up, I was, mm. Cassie was running towards me down the road, I was panicking, short of breath, got myself through that, you joined me on the, um, on the zombie hill, and that was just really tough because um, we are just going so slow. Yeah. Um, but everyone was, but it was really hard to go from running four minute 30, five minute um, per kilometer to suddenly like 10 minute per kilometer, yeah. walk, jogging, um, yeah, it, it, that was really tough and that was in my head more than anything. And I think that just comes down to experience because I was the same when I was doing my one, you think, I'm going so slow, there's just surely no way everyone else is doing this, but most people are actually. Aside from the very lucky few at the very front who are racing it and they were going quick, our experiences in both races I think are fairly much for muchness. And I think what actually really got to me is like, I'm used to normal, you know, normal events, so a half marathon, okay, I know what that should probably take me even on a slow yeah. day. So in my head, I'm eight or so hours into this race, and I'm going, okay, well, I've only got another half marathon to go, so that's going to take me X amount of time. <laughs> no way. It's going to take you twice that time up this mountain. And, and it's suddenly that realisation, looking at the mountain, this is going to take me a flipping long time. Yeah, and I think we both had the same um, issues during the race that these superb watches that we have that tell us our splits per every kilometre. Oh my word, that got a little bit frustrating. I think my slowest kilometre in my race was a 35 minute kilometre. I do love this polar watch, but I was ready to throw it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but Fraser, getting to the finish line, what a feeling here. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, the finish line in Countman is, um, you know, you, you drop back down off the mountain and you finish just running, just running along tarmac, which, thankfully was a good way to finish because I found some sort of way to get into a sort of rhythm and it just was a relief to see that finish barrier, for, for, or ba banner rather, for, for you we were just going as you say up and up and up and it never stopped, the finish finally came at the very top and it, it was a really emotional experience wasn't it? It was, for, I'm sure it was for you but Norseman is, as I've said in our, our video, is mm. um, it meant a lot to me yeah. and actually having you and Cassie there, whew, yeah, 
<laughs> that, that got me you know, <laughs> yeah. a bit wild. Not also. again, surely. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, I've got it all out of my system now, but it, it, it meant a heck of a lot. Um, and you know, as I, I touched on in the video, um, Cassie and myself made a lot of sacrifices mm. and it meant a lot having her there as well. So that was a really special thing about these races. Actually, the people that ordinarily would make, might be just on the sidelines and mm. have sacrificed a lot with you, were involved in the race, and that was a really nice thing about these oh, th these events. Hundred percent, Mark. It was it was a superb part of this race, and I think b both of our races, the finish um, sort of scenarios encapsulated that. We just were able to a shade it with those who had been helping us throughout the day, and just made us feel like a team. And I mean, you had your dad there, someone who's yeah. probably you know sacrificed a lot when you were a kid, um, ferrying you around to. No, I, I mean it was great. I mean, and, and, and you know, I had mum tracking from a home and mm. other family members, and the same with you. That's what's really super about these races. Everybody, you know, if they are able to be there, that's amazing. But if they weren't, there's still this feeling that we were all doing this together, wasn't yeah. it? And everyone who's helped us in both our sort of long careers of racing, this was this sort of really nice way of, I don't know, it was kind of like certainly for me, it felt like tying things together. Mm. Um, because I, you know, for me, luckily, I was doing a race that was in Scotland, and I've talked about how proud I am to be Scottish and all of that stuff. But for you, there was clearly a huge um, motivating factor because you've talked about how you had spotted Norseman in a magazine when you were basically just coming into the sport. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, in short, what an experience and um, it, what a community as well mm. in these X Try events. A fantastic atmosphere at the finish line and the dinners after and whatnot. Um, couple of tips for our viewers out there, anything you picked up on? Oh goodness, I mean get yourself in a ballot for one of these races for a start because they are definitely becoming sought after events, they really are, I mean all of these X Try races are getting many 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 more applicants for their ballot system than um, there are spaces in the race unfortunately. If you can, if you're lucky enough to be able to get to the event, wreck it. I know that's not something that a lot of people are able to do because the race could be really far away. I mean those people literally from all over the globe that were um, in Scotland when um, I finished. I was having really good chats with people from all corners, yeah. and, and you did the same. Well, we were incredibly fortunate to get a start, so we're very thankful to mm. everyone out there that helped us to get that. Um, my bits of advice actually would be everything that you think you know about triathlon, throw that out the window. <laughs> yeah. Start fresh, this is completely <laughs> new, completely different. One bit of really good advice I got given by someone who'd done Norseman before is, forget about doing your paced runs and your power on the bike, just go hilly. Go for long walks as well. Like mm. Go off into the hills and do long days out walking. And that could be with your family and your yeah. partner, your significant other. Just, just go and get some time on the legs. So that kind of arduous miles where you're just like fatigue and wearing down, having to go over boulders because these are like these are strong strong man events almost like they they and, whittle you down yeah and that type of um activity as such is, is is generally largely difficult different to anything we had done so it, it tired us even more and on that note of it being totally different my other good bit of advice that i was given and i totally forgot this until now was put your head up and have a look around at the stunning scenery because in both races we were so fortunate to be in incredible um, parts of the world um, and just don't think about it as a race, throw that instinct out the window and just pop your head up, slow down and take it all in and I really tried to do that and I know you did too. Mm, definitely, um, actually that was <laughs> kept me distracted from the race in itself, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, fantastic. Well, as a lot of you will know out there, I am off to compete in, or I should probably rephrase it, I'm off to try and complete the Norseman Extreme Triathlon. In fact, by the time that you guys are watching this video, I will be just moments away from jumping off the back of a ferry into some rather icy cold waters of a fjord in Norway and about to start my rather gruelling day out there. Now, the Norseman Extreme Triathlon is the event that I have wanted to do for years mainly because it's just so different from any other triathlon or event for that matter. So with that in mind, it comes with some rather unusual and different kits. So I thought you'd find it quite interesting today for me to run through my Norseman kit list. Well, to give you a little bit more background on the Norseman event, it is essentially over an Ironman distance. So I've got a 3.8 kilometer swim, 180 kilometer bike, 
and finishing with a 42.2 kilometer run over a point to point course. Now the swim actually starts in the Hardanger Fjord in Eidfjord, then the bike takes in the largest mountain plateau in Northern Europe, and then the run actually finishes at the top of Mount Gustatoppen, taking in a total elevation of over 5,235 meters. Ouch. Yeah, now this extreme triathlon also requires you to have a support team. So this support team can join me for segments of the bike course, also sections of the run course. In fact, it's actually mandatory for one or at least one support team member to join an athlete for the final five kilometers of the run as you go to the summit of the Mount Gustatuppen. And for me, that is fortunately gonna be Fraser, so I'm in good hands. And conveniently, by having that support team, it actually means that I can take loads of different changes of kit for all weather conditions and eventualities. So I'm gonna have loads of kit in the car ready for me, including a lot of food. So let's start off by running through my swim kit. So for this, I'm actually gonna be using the Maverick thermal wetsuit from Roka. So this is a slightly beefed up, slightly warmer wetsuit. It's a little bit thicker than your normal wetsuit. Maybe not quite as flexible, but it's still a very nice wetsuit, um, which I'm gonna need given that the water temperatures in the fjord can get as low as around 10 degrees. And given that we've had a bit of a heat wave lately, I've heard that it is melting some of the ice caps. We've got that cold ice running into the waters. That's not it though. I'm not stopping there because I'm actually going to potentially wear a thermal base layer. So this is one from Orca. They actually do a sleeve version, but I'm opting for a non-sleeved option just because I think having that base layer coming down on the sleeves might just, well, cause a bit of chafing under the arms and whatnot. But I have been training with this and it's actually really comfortable and does make a big difference. Under all of that, I'm actually gonna be opting for this Orca Speed Suit or Tri Suit. This is the RS1, which you've probably seen someone like Sebastian Keeney wearing. I really like this suit. Um, I was toying with another suit, but this is a super comfortable suit. It's quite thin, but I'm probably gonna be putting some extra clothing on over the top of this when I come out of the swim. But I'll get, go through that a little bit later on. I've also got the option of wearing some booties. Again, I don't know about these until I get there and I see just how cold the water is, but um, I do actually struggle with the cold quite a bit. So as you can tell, I'm going prepared um, because I really don't want my extremities to get cold or cold through to the bone because that is pretty much race over for me once that happens. I'd rather just be comfortable and get through this. This isn't a competition for me, or at least that's what I'm trying to tell myself. And finally, I'm going for a skull cap. So this is something I just wear under the swim hat, goggles on over the top of it, and this will just stop that ice cream head. Not the greatest look, but makes a big difference. Oh, and one last thing, my goggles. So I've been using the Roka F1 goggles for a while. Haven't actually used these yet, but these are an orange lens. So the idea of this is it enhances the light. And given that I'm gonna be starting quite early in the morning, it can be a little bit dark. Um, this is gonna enhance that light a little bit more. Failing that, I'm just gonna have a really clear lens. So that's my option for the swim. I will take some mirrored ones just in case, but I'm fairly sure I'm gonna need those. Well now onto the bike and I'll start with the actual bike before I go onto the kit. Now I'm gonna be using my Canyon Speed Mats, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen already on this channel quite a few times because I do really quite like this bike. Um, in terms of its actual setup and componentry, um, I have been toying with the idea of switching from a 5339 to maybe a 5539. Now, 5539 is not what they normally suggest, but I have run it in the past with a chain catcher, and a lot of pros do that, uh, just so you've got that versatility of choice. Um, I may actually, I think I'm just gonna leave it at 53.39 just because I just wanna complete this race. I'm not that worried about the performance so much other than getting that black t-shirt going to the top. Um, I've currently got an 11.28 cassette on there. Again, I may change that. I might go for something even slightly easier because there are some punchy climbs in this race. Um, in terms of the wheels, actually, at the moment, I've got these lovely Envy wheels on there, although I'm tempted to go for something slightly deeper. Fraser actually used some uh, Zip 808s or 858s for his Keltman race, so I may be borrowing a, those off him for that race. Um, I'm running Clincher, um, 25 mil, 
Um, just making sure I've got good traction. I won't be pumping up to anything crazy. Um, hydration, fuel setup. I'm just going to have a bottle here. I'll have my hydration set up here, full, full of energy drink. But got something quite interesting here at the front end because Martin from Racewear, which is a UK company, does some very fancy 3D printing for bike components, um, computer mounts. He does a lot of stuff actually for tour riders as well, um, pro tour riders. He's actually made me a mount specifically for these aero bars, which is really quite special. It fits a polar bike computer on the top. And because we want to capture footage from the race, he's actually managed to build a GoPro mount underneath. But this is all specific to the angle of my aero bars, the thickness of my aero bars, all for this bike. So absolutely amazing. So thanks ever so much, Martin. Um, have currently got the Polar V650, which is quite a big computer. I'm probably gonna go for the smaller computer, but this is what I had lying around the office today. Um, now let's move on actually to the actual kit choices. So I'm whip around here now. Um, in terms of my helmet, I'm actually going to be using the Cask Mistral, which is a helmet you guys will have seen on the channel before. So it's uh, got a little bit of a tail to it, similar shape to the Bambino. But for me, this fits me really nicely. It sits into my, the top of my back really well. Uh, I've got a clear lens on here at the moment. I'm probably going to start off with that. Although I do have the choice, which Cask have kindly sent through to me for this race. If I can open this, I have got an orange lens. Now, you heard me talk about using an orange lens earlier for the swimming. Now, this has the same properties for the bike, it enhances the light. So if it is particularly dark on race day, I can very easily just pull that off. It's got magnets and just clip that one on. Or if I don't need it at all, if the rain's particularly bad and I can't see, I can just clip it up there. So um, I will have probably a spare one in the car. I even have a mirrored one in case it's remarkably sunny, who knows? Um, and I'll just get Fraser to clean them and everything for me. Might as well whilst he's there. Um, now, in terms of other kit on the bike, you heard me talk about using the tri-suit earlier, but probably putting some extra clothes on. It is actually mandatory that we have some form of high visibility. So I have got a basic high-vis vest here, which um, a lot of athletes will be using. Although, other athletes have opted for something slightly more substantial and better fitting. So I have got this through from ASOS. This is just their, their wind cape. Um, so it's quite thin, but it's really well fitted and it's still got that high vis property. So I'm ticking that box, that's fine with Norseman, um, but depending on the conditions, I'll switch between two. I've also got an ASOS um, rain cape, which I haven't got here today, but that's a really thick, heavy duty cape. So that's gonna keep me nice and warm if it is torrential and really cold. I've got some extra stuff here, so I'm probably not gonna be doing quite as quick a transition as usual. So I'm gonna be putting on things like overshoes if I feel it's particularly cold. I'm just gonna make sure that I'm warm. I've got gloves, I've got a little cap that I can put on underneath my helmet um, if I really need to, but aero helmets tend to be a little bit warmer. Uh, I've got arm warmers, knee warmers. Um, ah, here we go, let's go on to food actually because this is quite interesting. So on the bike, I will be using I've been using Morton quite a bit, uh, but I've been mixing up. I've used SIS, I've used Enovit, so I do quite like the Morton stuff, so I'm probably going to start with that. But because I've realised I really like just comfort food, I'm going to be taking out just stuff that I'm used to, so loads of chocolatey bars, lots of Mars bars, Boost bars, don't know if you get that where you are, but I do love them. Lots of cans of Coke, so I'm going to have that stocked up in the car. Um, but yeah, um, that's pretty much it for the bike stuff. Now let's move on to the run stuff. Now, depending on the weather conditions, I may actually change completely out of my tri-suit into some normal running gear just so that I'm comfortable, I'm dry, and I'm warm. But one thing I do need to make sure is that I've got all my kit checked. So I've got to have a bag that is checked before the race, not just for myself, but also for Fraser. He's gonna have a bag himself for the final 5K. And we each have some mandatory gear that we need to carry within that. Now, I've chucked a load of extra stuff in this bag just so I can run through with you. So I'm gonna be running with this bag here. It's just a small running pack, which I'll be honest, I haven't used that often, maybe once or twice, but it is comfortable enough, it's fine. So I chucked a few things in here. I've got a hat that I'll probably be taking just to, in case it gets cold. So running gloves, a head torch in case, um, Things get a bit emotional out there and they're too long up the mountain. I've chucked this in. I'll probably give this to Fraser. It's just a um, first aid pack. Hopefully I won't need that. Um, socks, 
This will probably stay in transition. Change of socks just to make sure that my feet are nice and dry. I've got to take some trousers with me. So I've got some sort of thin waterproof trousers here that I could chuck on over the top. I may actually have some tights as well, just normal running tights. Um, got a long sleeve top here that I can chuck on. Um, I've also got sort of a windproof, slight rainproof top. Not really sure where it is, but it'll keep me warm. Um, I've also it just so happened to have a, uh, a compass in here. That's not mandatory, but I'm probably just going to take it just in case. Um, and a hydration pack, so I'd have water on the go just sticking out of here. Um, in terms of my footwear, I've actually been running in the new on cloud Stratus quite a lot in my training. Personally, my favorite running shoe. Um, it's a good mileage shoe. I'm really happy with them. I am going to be heading off road but I'm hardly gonna be running by that point. I'm pretty much gonna be walking. So um, yeah, I think this shoe will probably just work for all. I did toy with the idea of using their off-road pair of shoes. So comfortable with these, I think these are gonna do for all. So of course, we are currently in the middle of a heat wave. So I've talked about all this cold weather gear, which is still necessary given that I am going up to the top of the mountains from quite high altitude. It may be quite hot out there. At the moment, I believe it's 32 degrees in Voss. So I am also going to be packing vest shorts and some warm weather gear, but it is still important, given I'm going to the top of the mountain, that I have this cold weather gear too. In any normal race, I think he, I would not even consider him a, a threat because he lost like 10, 12 minutes to the front in the swim. Seb is in front. <laughs> Pretty confident that I will outrun him uh, at Sombe Hill. It's going to be the most interesting part. <laughs> if I make this, I will be incredibly proud. Uh, hopefully, it will be a really close battle. The Norseman Extreme Triathlon, dubbed the toughest triathlon in the world. Everything about this event is crazy. A 3.8 kilometer swim, starting by jumping off the back of a ferry in the early hours into the freezing waters of a fjord. A 180 kilometer bike leg with almost 3,000 meters of elevation gain. And a marathon to finish, which climbs to over 1,800 meters above sea level. Not to mention the drastically interchangeable weather. This event is as tough and raw as they come. Not the kind of place you would expect to see this guy. Hello, my name is Sebastian Kienle. I'm from Germany. I'm 39 years old. I am doing the sport for 31 years now. This is my final year in the sport. Um, I've won three world titles in, uh, in Ironman, long course and middle distance racing, but I've never done Norseman. And of course, my goal is to win the race. So who do you think is your biggest rival? Uh, I just know one guy, um, and that's uh, John Breivold. Uh, my name is Jon Breivold. I'm 28 years old, and uh, I'm a professional triathlete uh, from Norway. Um, I've only been doing triathlon for three years. I used to be a cyclist at the uh, continental level, but I switched to triathlon just to pursue the dream of Norseman, actually. Having Sebastian race here is, uh, is really quite special. Uh, he's one of the biggest leg legends in the sport, and just having him to race here and going against him in this course, it's going to be really special. He was sixth in Kona last year. Yeah, I think I need to be just at my best uh, level and um, have the most energy left when we are arriving uh, Zombie Hill, I think that's my territory. Are you getting ready? <laughs> we'll find out. Have you had some minutes of sleep? Yeah. <laughs> you bike here? Okay. Yes. You bike. Seems like we're too late.
It all starts with the jump from the ferry a little bit before five o'clock in the morning. And, uh, the ferry horn goes off and then it all starts with the swim. Uh, we just follow the shore uh, until we get into Eidfjord, so it's, it's quite easy to swim, it's not technical. Uh, and then we take a sharp left turn uh, and we swim for about uh, 500 meters and then we're into T1. There's also a lot of reasons why I believe I can beat John. I mean, he lost like 10, 12 minutes to the front in the swim in Switzerland, Ironman Switzerland. So on the swim, I think uh, Sebastian will probably be around five minutes before me uh, if I have a good swim and get some good legs to, to be on on the swim. We've got two athletes coming out here who've got a little bit of a breakaway and I believe there's a third athlete somewhat behind them and then another big gap. Our lead athlete coming out of the water now and that is Sebastian Gienli, first out of the water. Just see some more swimmers here coming around the corner. So fourth out of the way at water there in the Quintana Roo wetsuit. That was Jon Bravold, who is the reigning champion on this course. Probably we'll catch Sebastian before we do it on it. That would be the ideal situation. Uh, and if I haven't uh, catched him before Imingfjell, that's where I will put in the most power. Oh no, Braveold is behind him. Here is number one. It's not. Fun. It's only five minutes. Yeah. Okay. So he he lost his bottle, going a bit out of uh, the original plan. But uh, yeah, hope is uh, not. Uh, Stressed about that uh, lost uh, bottle. We're just looking down the road behind us here. We can see the first cyclist just coming up to this point. It's been one minute. So Jan Bravold, Norwegian athlete, two times winner on this course, just coming up here now. It looks like his gap is a little large this time, about one minute, 24 seconds behind Sebastian. We missed the bike, but it looks pretty good now. Yeah. It looks like we're struggling a little bit. Yeah? Yeah, a little bit. Change is so fast. really get a sense up here actually of that lonely athlete in a big landscape and this isn't just any old triathlon this is an adventure in the mountain
what makes this bike course really tough, first of all, it takes so much longer. You know, I mean, this is not a bike course that you finish in four hours. This is not a bike course that you finish in four hours. It's that makes it tough because it's longer. You have, just have to uh, push for so much longer. I think that's what the people are looking for when they signed up for the race here. They want to uh, be pushed to their limits and they will push to their limits. So we start in at zero at the sea level and we go up to, I think it is 1,200 meters above sea level. And the gradients are shifting a little bit, but uh, at some point, points it's about maybe seven, eight percent. Uh, so a bit steep in some parts and other parts are a little bit more flat, but uh, in total maybe five percent average. And when you come up to Dyranut, then you get to the flat, flat part of Norseman which is, uh, you're going uh, from Dyranu to, to Yailo. It's about uh, 40, 45 k or something, uh, where it's slightly downhill all the way. And there are some rolling hills, but uh, yeah, mostly downhill, and it will be a really fast section of the race. I know the course quite, uh, quite well, I would say, especially the, like, the middle part of the cycling, because I have my family cottage there. So I've been there several times and been biking up up the mountain of Imingfjell. That's my territory and uh, my favorite uh, uh, part of this race probably. Another uh, of his uh, aero buckles on his back, and uh, now we only have. Well, uh, Breivold caught up to Zibi, so, uh, so they're riding together. So now the mind game start, uh, the tactics probably, everybody there has, uh, has his own tactics. Um, I think Zibi should not go to the front because he's not the favorite. Breivold knows the course, he, kept, he was catching up, so, so he, he has to make the race, he's the favorite, this is, he has to get used to that. And it will be interesting um, how this pans out, the last climb. Um, Breivold, maybe he wants to get rid of him, maybe he wants to, you know, save his legs, go with Sebi onto the run and then attack, we'll see. Uh, yeah, it's a really tight race, it's uh, what we wished for actually. I just hope in the end Sebi is on the top. On the switchbacks behind us, our first leading athlete just coming up the road here. This is Jan Breivold, who holds the course record, making up this really very steep hill with ease, so not looking like it's troubling him too much. Um, Sebastian Kianli probably not too far behind him, playing cat and mouse it seems with Jan Breivold in the mountains today.
I think my chances are quite good when it comes to the run. Um, I'm quite confident in my run. I did a 2.45 run, uh, third best run in Ironman Switzerland. So uh, that was completely flat, so I can run quite well in the flat. And uh, I've trained a lot in, uh, with, um, during my entire life. I've been training a lot in hills and doing hill running. And I know that I have a good capacity for running uphill. So if I manage to arrive in Sumbi Hill with sufficient energy stores, then I'm pretty confident I will outrun him uh, up there. Sebastian Kenley coming through and headed out onto the run. On Saturday, I was uh, really feeling the stomach. Working with the, the, the gels. Oh. Uh, little. A little too much on the, a little too many gels, I think, and uh, his stomach is not uh, very comfort comfortable. But uh, I think uh, with some water and uh, not so many gels, the next uh, 10 k's, and it will be okay. But. Uh, yeah, needed a toilet break. A big toilet, toilet break, so uh, we hope some coke will fix it and uh, coke, water, coke, and then uh, it should be fine, but uh, if the energy levels uh, going down, it's, it's not good because uh, it still needs to fuel and uh, top up the energy levels, so... Uh, the stomach uh, is not good for you. His uh, gels just uh, going straight through his body, and uh, I will not get in. But his uh, yeah. the speed is not that bad. But uh, I think he's feeling the, the stress on the stomach. What pretty much all long course races are about, and this one especially, is that it brings you to a point where you don't want to do it anymore. And I think that's basically the perfect um, will breaker. I think uh, if you see that that road, and yeah, it's the, the ultimate test because usually at that point you get tired in a race, like you get really tired and you don't want to do it anymore. It's just you try to find some mental tricks to get yourself going, but um, this is even worse because, yeah, uh, you basically run out of gas and then somebody puts on the handbrake and puts yourself on a very steep hill. <laughs> um, the only thing that stops you from rolling down again is that handbrake. <laughs> but when you want to go up, 
no fuel, handbrake on and very steep. You have to push pretty hard. Stomach? Yeah. Yeah, it's getting better. Okay, good. But four breaks now. Oh, wow. So if I make this, I will be incredibly proud. And yeah, the team doing an amazing job. So you're looking really good, mate. Very good. Yeah, I'll try to keep up the pace. The organisers have had to take the really difficult decision now to close the mountain for the rest of the day. It's not safe to allow our athletes, our supporters and our crew of the mountain today. We'll just carry on straight back up to the end of the mountain where they would usually ascend and then come straight back down here to our alternative finish line. So Jan Braveholm has fought an amazing race today in sun, rain, now thunderstorms to reach this point at the end of our Ironman distance Norseman 2023 race. We're just going to take in these sights for a minute as he comes to our finish line. Here he is. Uh, I think everything that I expected uh, from the race was pretty much happening. Um, I think we had pretty good conditions most of the, the time. Unfortunately, uh, when we approached the very final part, the conditions were not too good. And I mean, there's always a small mod margin between just hard and uh, dangerous and stupid. Unfortunately, it was on the dangerous and stupid uh, side. So therefore, uh, uh, my uh, black T-shirt has some white spots on it because I wasn't at the very top, but I can assure you, this last 4K downhill were probably even worse than, uh, um, than the last bit up, up uh, the, the mountain. What makes the race hard for professionals is the competition. And for me, therefore, it was very, very tough because I had very good competition. But still, when I heard the first gap of like a minute 20 after the climb, I was like, okay, this is gonna be a tough ask. And, um, but I had really good legs, I mean, I didn't have a bad day on the bike. I mean, I completely emptied the tank actually at like 150k into the bike because I just tried to stay with him at one point. It was pretty uh, clear that it's between me and him. And uh, I knew that it's not, it's not on a long run. It's either like I'm able to stay with him and then really put pressure on him on the run or it's over. So. Uh, the last climb was, I mean, really, really strong from him. I mean, that's also the reason why I say this, because for me, the last climb, um, so there's four climbs, they are round about between three and four K long, average of maybe 7% uh, or so in climb, and the last one is maybe a little bit steeper. And I had maybe uh, six, seven minutes of like 360, 370 uh, watts, and that's four and a half uh, hours into the into the race, or for for te 15 probably into the race. So uh, if you are able to to put that amount of power that late in the race, that's I mean he definitely deserved this win. I think if it would be time trial triathlon, so everybody starting on his own, and it would be a the World Championships in Nice, this guy would be uh, top five for sure. Um, I mean, he has a deadly uh, run uh, bike combination, that's for sure. And I think he had a decent swim uh, yesterday, so yeah. Normally in Norseman, I just uh, I have a plan uh, on what power I should produce and what pace I should run at, and I just do my own race. Uh, but this time, with the battle between me and uh, Sebi, it was a bit different. Uh, and especially since I was so close after the swim, only a little bit more than three minutes behind. 
then things change completely and I and I plan to actually catch him before on the first climb before do on it to just uh, yeah uh, don't lose any time on the fast sections where I knew that he would be quite fast uh, and when I finally overtook him uh, not on the on it but uh, after about 100k uh, then he just stayed on my wheel and uh, I tried to go a bit a little bit fast but I understood that uh, he doesn't plan to do his own race uh, he will just stick to my wheel as long as possible so yeah then I had to change things uh, during the race and that's different than uh, what I normally do in Norsen. You know, he's a superstar uh, in this sport. Uh, it's probably only Jan Frodeno who has like a bigger name and probably like Christian Blumenfeld, you know. Uh, so yeah, that he was just co coming and race Norseman, that was great, uh, great for me and to be able to beat him. I mean, I will still stay in the sport in uh, uh, one way or the other, definitely not as an athlete, but um, maybe you hear me behind the mic um, every now and then um, for, for German TV uh, probably and then obviously um, I will do some gravel races next year but first I need a break to forget all this pain and that I'm gonna hit the gas when I see the wall instead of hitting the brakes because that's what more and more is happening right now it's just I'm afraid of what's coming or my body just remembers <laughs> <laughs> and therefore it's quite tough to uh, like squeeze like this every single percent out of my legs. Therefore the legs feel good the day after that, but that's not what you want, right? Um, and then uh, I will uh, be involved in uh, kick-ass sports. Um, the coaching company I have with uh, Philip Seip and Laura Philip, I'll do a little bit more there. And then uh, I'll see my son somewhere in the backdrop. I probably have to become a little bit of a firefighter or something like that to be his hero. I mean, that's the ultimate goal of every dad is um, being the hero of the son. And I'm not sure if he was too impressed of my performance yesterday. <laughs> so therefore, maybe I have to, you know, um, become an uh, operator of a big digger or something like that. Yeah. This is an incredibly exciting and special pro bike for you today because this is Sebastian Keeney's custom pro bike for the Norseman Triathlon and quite possibly the lightest triathlon bike I have ever come across at 7.2 kilograms. Wow. Firstly, I apologize for the weather. Um, typical Norwegian weather and Norseman weather for that. Um, although nothing compared to what the athletes had to face yesterday, so I can't really complain. Uh, Sebastian obviously placed second in the Norseman Triathlon and he did so on this insane bike. Now, this has actually been custom made by Dangerholm, who is a custom bike specialist. He has made particularly many mountain bike frames where he'll strip them down and make them super lightweight, add incredibly lovely parts to it. Um, and his bikes always just look absolutely superb. So he's done this one for Sebastian. We featured many of Dangerholm's bikes at Eurobike and various things like that before. But this is the first TT bike I've seen from him. Now, the interesting thing here is the actual frame itself to get this bike super light isn't actually the classic Scott Plasma TT frame. It's actually the Scott foil road frame and forks, but then obviously it added some TT parts to it. So let's take a closer look at all of that now. So Dangerholm has meticulously sanded this frame down to save every ounce, every gram possible. So we've got this bare exposed carbon on the frame here. On the top tube though, just to add a bit of excitement and color to this, we have got this metallic red on the top tube and then matching that on the fork. So then finally, obviously adding the branding on. So we've got the Scott decals added on here, which do match with that color red and with the decals also on the wheels. But now let's 
Take a look at actually some of the TT and tri aspects that have been added to this road frame, starting with the front end. So they very neatly and very cleanly managed to integrate this triathlon base bar onto this road frame, onto the foil road frame. I can't say for sure whether it's actually from a plasma TT bike or not, but either way, they've managed to do it. And from that, they've then managed to add on uh, Sebi's custom aero bars. So these are from Radsport Ibert. They've been custom made for Sebi's arms, the shape of his arms and how he likes to hold them when he's racing. So this bit here, all the way up to here is one piece. So underneath it's completely covered. There's no gaps in there. And then it splits off into two grips at the end. And we've got the SRAM blips on the end. He's then actually also got the kind of the blip junction box built in very neatly into these aero bars. There's a little access port for them here, but there's nothing sticking out. There's no cables exposed. So very, very nice. Coming down again back onto this base bar. Also, what's interesting, and I've seen this before on Sebi's bikes, is he's actually using the sprinter shifts from SRAM down here. And that allows him to sort of just neatly place them underneath the base bar. And obviously that just suits how he rides and how he'd like to place his hand when he's um, on the base bar. And that is all sort of neatly tucked in around this grip. But again, it's not a bulky grip. He hasn't chosen sandpaper either. He obviously has decided to have a grip for comfort, but it's very tightly woven and it's not bulky. And then onto wheels and group set, which I'm actually gonna scoot over a little bit because they're pretty standard, really. And I want to get onto some more exciting stuff. So wheels wise, he's using the Zip 858 NSW wheels, which are actually relatively deep wheels considering the elevation on this course, but they're also incredibly light. So there are actually still on the Norseman course, many sections that are quite fast. So definitely the 858s will come into their own there. But as I say, they're still very light wheels too. In terms of the group set, he's using SRAM Red ETAP Axis. So he's got uh, 170 mil crank lengths here. He's using a 5643 uh, chain rings on the front and a 1033 to match on the back. And then of course he's got the Speedplay Aero pedals on there. But what I am excited to do is talk about this area here. So this isn't Sebi's normal setup. He's got a dash saddle on which sort of directly mounts to the seat post. And as I say, this isn't the saddle that Sebi would normally use on his triathlon bikes, but this is all in pursuit of shaving and saving weight. And what's interesting is that doesn't allow for really any storage space for spares and whatnot. So on that saddle, there's actually space sort of cut into the back here where he's got his canister. He's actually got tubeless um, plugs and everything. That's shoved in there. He's got tape over the top of that and then some Velcro. And I saw him on the morning actually attaching this and I couldn't quite see it at the time and figure out what it was. But what he had is actually his chip all in there, tracking device that he then had put in another bag, Velcroed onto the top there and it fit just neatly behind his backside there. So very smart. Attached very neatly also to that saddle. And this is all part of the saddle, just to be clear. Coming off is bolted on is the Topeak Secure Entry Tri Cage. And um, just so you can have one spare there. And then he's also got the Elite Chrono Bottle down here on the down tube. Oh, and sorry, one last thing in my excitement to get to all the saddle and everything. I forgot to talk about the tires. So he's actually running the Schwalbe Pro 1 TT tires. They're a prototype tire though, so obviously slightly different. And what's interesting is he's actually running 28 both front and rear. And as I said, these are tubeless. All in all, an absolutely incredible bike. I'm sorry, it's a very quick pro bike and I'm sorry about the weather, but we had a very small opportunity to film this bike and I'd been absolutely daft to have passed that one up. 7.2 kilograms though. If you've seen a lighter TT bike, let me know, but I think that trumps them at the moment anyway. Let me know in the comment section down below what you think to this bike, but if you've enjoyed it, you like this bike, please do give it a thumbs up. See you next time.